Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is Know Before You Go, Highlights of Northern Australia. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Matt Meyer. Matt, thank you so much for being here today. Let's go ahead and dive into this fun topic. Awesome. Thanks, Sunny. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining in today. Um, I'm freshly home from a trip and leaving in a couple of days. So caught me just uh, for a few days at home and I will be going over uh, what sort of what entails one of my favorite trips that we've just started in the last year and a half. Um, and then to give you an opportunity to answer a couple of questions if I didn't cover it in the presentation. So, uh, yeah, firstly, a little bit about myself. Uh, well, first of all, uh, on behalf of Nat having the WWF, thank you for, uh, for coming. And for those of you that are going to be coming with, uh, with one of us expedition leaders in Australia this year, you will see a very similar um, presentation to this. This is going to mold it off of our uh, welcome presentation on the first night. So we'll be going over a lot of very similar information, um, and this will help hopefully help you uh, to pack and get ready for uh, this adventure. Um, so yeah, a little bit about myself. My name is Matt. I live in South Africa. Some of these are taken in Australia. Obviously, the one with the warthog on my head is not. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been guiding for that. have now going on this my seventh season and do trips across um, the whole of Africa and Australia now um, in the last two or three seasons. Um, and Australia is really becoming uh, one of my favorite places to guide. It's new, it's exciting. Um, and all of the places that we go on both the northern and the southern itinerary and then next year, starting with the ultimate are just such fun and so diverse and different from one another. Um, so we're going to dive into the northern um, itinerary and then, uh, yeah, give you a, a little bit of time to answer a couple, ask a couple of questions towards the end. So as you can see here, we uh, the four or five places that we go to on our northern itinerary, we start off in Brisbane um, in uh, central Queensland and uh, well, southern Queensland, sorry. And then we head up to uh, Lady Elliot Island. It's the very southern tip of the Great Barrier Reef. We stay there on a Coral Cay Island um, and we're there for three nights. Lots of opportunities to go snorkeling, bird watching, and, um, and it's just a, a beautiful place to be uh, essentially centered for our stay um, on the Great Barrier Reef. It's one of only three or four islands on the entire reef that you can actually stay on the reef without being on a charter boat. So that gives us the opportunity to explore a massive rookery of several uh, migrating oceanic birds, um, as well as uh, it's the known as the home of the manta ray. So during manta ray season between May and September, um, this specific reef because of its cleaning stations, um, where the the big uh, the big and all the big ocean animals come up to get cleaned by the, the smaller little guys, uh, they have the highest they call it the highest ping rate of um, of reef mantas in the entire reef. So great place to be, um, and that's usually when we're traveling there. Then from there we fly back to Brisbane. From Brisbane we head up to northern Queensland uh, to the, the city of Cairns where we spend a quick night before heading into the Daintree rainforest the world's oldest rainforest and then the Atherton Tablelands uh, we're there for three nights where we explore at a fast pace with our uh, far northern Queensland team and um, and we get to explore a lot of the region and see a lot of the amazing wildlife and places in that area and then from there back down to Cairns where we hop on a, on another plane to Darwin and we overnight in Darwin get to see a bit of the city a little of the cultural highlights go to the botanical gardens and then from there we head out to Bamaroo Plains where we are for three nights and we spend one of the days exploring the region 
uh, in their extensive wetlands. And then the other day we head across to Kakadu uh, National Park, which is um, on the east or between the east and the west Alligator River. And we get to explore some, um, there's a, a beautiful walk where we get to look at some rock art by some native First Nations Australians. And, uh, and then also go on a river cruise down uh, the East Alligator River. So, and that's the last star over there. So our first stop, Lady Elliot Island, you can see this island here. So Coral Cay Island is essentially, um, it's an island on uh, a, a bit of coral that gets, the coral gets broken and compacted from wave movement and pushed into kind of, if you can imagine, sweeping sand um, on the floor and you want to sweep them to a pile before you put them to a dustpan. That's essentially what a Coral Cay Island is. And so um, it's uh, because a lot of the Great Barrier Reef doesn't actually have that much uh, island or land mass on it until you get up north. And so uh, you can see here this island, if you were to look at it in, so in, in terms of the uh, uh, clock face with the um, the airstrip cutting it in two. The part that's at the bottom um, are the main reefs that we go and uh, and snorkel off of. You can see a couple of little uh, boats there. Those are the glass bottom boats that we take out. Um, and then on the other side, they've got the lagoon, which is usually available for anyone that just wants to hop off the beach and go swimming. There's no access into open water from there. Um, the reef kind of makes a, a natural rock pool um, and that's obviously still tide dependent because the lower the tide, the higher up the coral is. And sometimes there's just not enough, uh, not enough water to swim in. So that's the island um, from an overview. This is as we fly in. So we've got a beautiful scenic flight from Redcliffe Airport uh, outside of uh, Margate, which is where we're staying. Um, and we head up north along the coast. We get to see a lot of the coastline of, uh, of Queensland. Um, up until the point where the Great Barrier, the, the southern part of the Great Barrier Reef, and then we fly out into the ocean. And as the pilot comes into land here, we, we will bank on either way so that both sides of the plane get this beautiful aerial view. Um, and this was a photo that I took flying in on one of the trips. Um, so a little bit of an explanation of, uh, of the island here. You can see that green at the bottom right is the lagoon and that's obviously where you can swim straight off the beach all of those blue dots that's where the main resort area is and where the main lodge is and where the dive shop and all of that then there's the airstrip going down the middle and everything to the left hand side of that is all the eco zone uh, and one of the things that we get to do which you'll see a few slides of in a little bit is actually do a behind the scenes tour with the the resident ecologist uh, Jim, he, uh, they, they, it wasn't something that they really did. And when we started visiting, obviously with a lot of our travelers being very, very interested in conservation and, uh, and this sort of thing and how they've been able to, uh, to restore this island, because this island was completely cleared for, uh, for guano mining. So because it's a rookery for, uh, for three or four noddies, or three or four noddies, two noddy species and a couple of terns. At any point in time, you could have 60 or 70,000 birds nesting on the island. Now that over time, over four or 5,000 years, is gonna develop a pretty thick layer of guano. And so um, when the island was first discovered, they mined it almost flat and they cleared all of the trees, they cleared everything off there and they've been able to revive this island over the course of the last 30 or 40 years to be this incredible re rewilded biodiverse hotspot in the Southern Great Barrier Reef. So that little, uh, the yellow and the blue and the orange zone over on the left, those are the, the dive lines or the buoy lines, um, which follow the, uh, they follow the cleaning stations, the edges of the, um, the edges of the reef, and then um, what they call bommies. So bommies are basically just isolated um, pieces of coral. Kind of, it's just a column of coral and rock underneath. And that's where a lot of those cleaning stations are. And so at least on one of the mornings, we take a glass bottom boat out into the reef 
and then we uh, we have the opportunity to go uh, snorkeling at any whenever uh, the group wants um, or whenever we decide to go as a group or even as individuals we just ask guests to buddy up if they want to go um, out of uh, a group activity but we have a lot of things planned here for the three days that we're there um, there's a, a beautiful reef walk which tide dependent we go walking in the uh, in the reef um, in the lagoon and then um, uh, the the guides because all of their dives all, all of their guides are master reef guides so they will walk us through they are one of the only places on the barrier reef that are able to uh, feed uh, the fish for educational purposes so every day at a specific time they go out the guide will go out and they, they're only allowed doing it one cup at a time every day and they'll take it out they'll take the feed out and they'll feed the fish get them to come up to the surface so that we can observe them and see them and then on that reef walk if we encounter sea cucumbers or things uh, a sea star that isn't too embedded in the re in the coral they they're allowed to actually pick it up and show the guests, which is which is quite an experience. But again, that's it is it is tide dependent, so we'll just have to see um, uh, when we go there to what the tide's doing at that time of day. So this gives you an overview of uh, of the island and and what it is we can and can't do there, and then just some of the walking trails. Um, we will often do uh, uh, circumnavigate the, the island where we go birding for the, in the afternoon before sundown is, um, or yeah, it's just a really, it's, it's, a, it's a packed couple of days that we're there and most people don't really have uh, much, uh, we, 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 we were able to do most of the activities that they offer. Um, there's a behind the scenes tour to see their, their solar uh, system and all of their, the way they are able to make their lodge eco because remember they're on the reef there's no fresh water so everything's desalinated everything's repurposed recycled um, and it is a really uh, a remarkable job they've been able to do there and as i mentioned their ecological department or the eco department in being able to rewild and revegetate this piece of land is quite something so there's just an idea of uh, what we get to do on, on, on a reef walk. One of those beautiful big blue sea stars, probably about this big, and then a giant blue clam, which mouth was about that big. But you can see here, we go walking through on the reef. The, the, the water, your tide is best when it's low for this kind of thing so that you can see into the shallow water. But if it's too windy, like it was on this day, it does make it a bit tough to see, but we may do, and we we enjoyed it in any case. Um, then you can see here some of the highlights from the lagoon area. That's a, a, a beautiful parrotfish on the left, and there's a a little sea turtle there that someone is snorkeling with. These are all photos that I took uh, with my GoPro over the trips there from last year. Um, another sea turtle there. And then uh, the star of the show, the mantas. Now they're very seasonal. Um, depending on how late in the season uh, we go, they're usually there between May and September in high numbers. That's not to say if you go in October or November that you're not going to see them. It's just then the the numbers go a little bit lower because they're moving further out into the open ocean. Um, and you can see there their proximity is quite close. I mean. A GoPro doesn't really give you that uh, good an understanding of depth of field and, and proximity and distance, but this manta swam straight underneath us, it was gliding and probably got to within about five or six meters. Then this is the behind the scenes tour with the, uh, the ecologist and just showing us their nursery where they've been growing some of the, the plants before they get, uh, before they get planted out. Uh, across the island and then uh, the resident rookery birds the noddies um, as I mentioned at any point in time we could have in excess of 70 75,000 birds so it's estimated that there are about 60,000 individuals that will be there during the peak of the breeding season and if they all pair up you've got 30,000 pairs if all of them have a chick you've got 90,000 birds and they make a whole bunch of noise 
um but it is yeah it's quite something to see and it's 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 pretty cool um and uh some of those lesser crested terns that like to sit on the roof and face into the wind you can see the solar panels there um one of their uh, big solar fields is out onto near the airstrip side of things and um and then this is also a breeding area that it's it's usually these birds only breed in areas where they clips uh, because of how they fly and how bad they are at landing so this is a red-tailed tropic bird one of the few bird species that's been known to be able to fly backwards uh, now hummingbirds can go up down and kind of scoot backwards a little bit but it's in in preparation of going forwards these guys will actually fly backwards almost like a helicopter uh, reversing and they've got these beautiful big long red uh, sort of like tail feathers you could call them um like a black like trainers off the back of a dress um and when they're flying and they're doing their mating displays they just kind of float behind them um but they've got they're an oceanic bird so they don't spend too much time walking they're either flying or sitting on the ocean so they've got these back feet they, well they're not back feet their feet are all the way at the back of their body and they're kind of stunted so if you can imagine they don't really walk too well so they kind of scoot along on the, on, on the ground when they go to take off or to land and so they usually only do it on cliffs um, or very steep areas off the ocean but lady elliot is a, a favorite for them so they do spend quite a bit of time there and they breed there um so from lady elliot we go south back to brisbane brisbane up to cairns and then we go to uh the daintree now the daintree is the oldest rainforest uh, oldest rainforest in the world and this area north of cairns uh it's home to two world heritage sites that join one another so you've got the daintree rainforest and the great barrier reef and they are right next to each other uh being right on the coast so our time there, we start in Cairns and then we go up north to Mossman. So you can see here um, kind of a little bit uh, of a, an understanding of the way we, we go around. So Cairns up to Palm Cove to Port Douglas. And, um, and when we're there, we go to Mossman Gorge. We do a Dreamtime walk uh, with a, a, a local First Nations guide. Um, and he tells us a little bit, or she tells us a little bit about the forest that they grew up in, uh, some of their cultural beliefs, and um, talking about um, some of their practices when they were still living in the forest. And then from there, we go up to the Daintree, uh, cross over the Daintree River, and spend a day uh, between the Daintree and Cape Tribulation looking for the big bird, a cassowary. Then from there, we go back down onto the Daintree where we do uh, a riverboat cruise on Solar Whisper, which is a solar powered boat and it's a private cruise looking for some saltwater crocs. And then from there, we head down south and a little bit inland west where we go to the Atherton Tablelands looking for. Um, Duckball platypus and uh, tree kangaroos and a bunch of other uh, interesting creatures in that area. So we're in this region uh, and these are the, the areas that we go to, uh, or these are the highlights of those areas. And we're in that region for about well, for three nights, so four days or so. Um, so this is an idea of uh, the, the walk or the Dreamtime walk at Mossman Gorge. Um, so on the left is our guide telling us about how this is a beautiful big um, cedar tree that they used to use to make carvings out of and for communication, those big buttressed roots, they would hit them with rocks and it the sound is like a shotgun going off, it reverberates through the forest. And that's how if kids got lost or if someone didn't know their way, they would knock on that and at least that's someone that's kind of like a, a flare in the forest to go and find that person. Um, and then on the right hand side, that's her describing how each of the different uh, tribal clans within that uh, region would have different body paints or individuals would have different paints that would use different uh, um, materials in the forest to create these uh, black or 
ochre red or white uh, paints to be able to paint themselves uh, as an as an identification um, when they were going from walking through the forest um, and for ceremonies and such. Then after we head through Mossman, we go up north and then this is um, Jandalba Walk, uh, Boardwalk, which is uh, just south of where we stay uh, in the Daintree itself. And this is one of the first places where we start exploring and looking for casseries. But in doing so, we walk on these beautiful boardwalks through the rainforest. A lot of their, a lot of their walks in the rainforest are elevated so that we minimize our impact on stepping on the ground um, and erosion and all of that kind of thing. Uh, and you get to look at some of these. That's a, a cycad that's probably well over a couple of hundred years old. Um, and I mean, you can see the size of it if a cycad grows an inch every couple of years or a, a centimeter a year. That boardwalk, we're about 10 feet off the ground and that's 15 feet above our heads. So it's a, it's a pretty sizable um, cycad that. So this is a little sunbird that uh, we got to see on the, uh, the Solar Whisper cruise and um, a Papuan frogmouth on the left and then an azure uh, kingfisher on the right. So, uh, I mean, Australia, one of, the, one of the highlights of Australia are the, the, the bird life. And certainly the Daintree is, is an area that's high up on that highlight list of uh, species, number of species, and just the diversity of species. And then um, the star of the show there is to look for uh, our first view um, for saltwater crocodiles. Now, Dave, who is the owner of Solar Whispers, who's usually our guide, is a huge advocate and spokesperson for um, saltwater crocodiles, their preservation, conservation, and protection. Um, and I mean, if you can imagine, it's a, it's a crocodile, it's an apex predator. So being an apex predator, it's a keystone species in that river system. And if something happens to an individual, it either gets replaced by several others who could do more devastation, or it's void and invasive species are able to come in. So an integral part of the ecosystem, and that's the, the main target in our search on solar whispers on the Daintree. Then we also go for uh, walks at night. Um, so this is a night walk and we got to see this little um, Boyd's forest dragon. They're really cool and cryptic little creatures and they will move around the back of a if, so let's say this is a tree and this is the dragon and we're on that side as soon as you move around to try and look at him he moves around the back end of the tree and they're really good at avoiding being seen and so you can be walking in the forest and they will be on that side of the tree and as you walk around he'll move around and you won't see him and then someone five minutes behind you will see one because he's on this side of the tree thinking you've gone that way so really cool to see these creatures and also especially cool to see them nights and you get that that um that cool backlit look um where you can see where they get that dragon from with those spines on their back a little bit of um, aussie humor i should have mentioned that at the beginning that's one thing that a lot of people go to australia not looking for but they come back with it anyway is the the humor of the australians um, so this here, obviously, cassery at the top saying watch out and then the bottom is warning people about the speed bumps, but then someone's gone and scribbled a, a dead cassery in there saying slow down otherwise something's going to happen to them. Um, and then this is uh, a good example of um, seeing Big Bird with uh, some of the guys. So the guy in the background there with the binoculars on with his hands and his hips that's james he's usually uh, he's the owner of the company or the operator that we we use in northern queensland and he's often one of our guides and um yeah this is watching a, an adult cassowary within 15 feet uh or name deemed the world's most dangerous bird and we get to be really close personal with them and get to spend some time with them and they are quite remarkable i mean it's the size of an ostrich but shorter and stockier um doesn't weigh as much as an ostrich but can uh can live up to sort of 45 40 45 years in the wild and just a, a an amazing bird to spend time with and 
and C. Um, and they've got this giant big cask in their head that um, it's one of the most distinguished, well, easiest way to distinguish them. Um, obviously the, the emus and then ostriches uh, and the rays in uh, South America, they're all related, um, but these guys have that big cost that none of the other birds have got. This is a, a little dinosaur. Uh, no, it's a little uh, a young cassowary that's just left dad. So cassowaries, male and female, get together their mate. Female lays the egg. She leaves and goes and finds another male to mate again. Leaves dad to incubate and raise the chick. And this little one uh, was uh, fresh out of the clutch and going on an adventure by himself or herself. And, and a perfect example of how in the rainforest you can miss something and five minutes later someone sees it. We were walking along the boardwalk. We stopped to talk about mangroves. And next thing someone came up behind us and was like, did you guys see the cassowary back there? The baby cassowary. And the guys, James and Matt, were like, These, they, they, they don't know what they're talking about. They're, it's probably a, it's probably a um, they call them a, um, a bush chook or a, a scrub fowl and it, it's about this big and looks like a big chicken with red feet with yellow feet and people often confuse them for baby cassowaries and so we walked back there and there was this baby cassowary looking up at us like that so we had to we were very well, luckily we didn't say to the, the other people that they were being silly and it was a, a bush chook but um but we sat with this little guy for a, a little while as he walked underneath us in that boardwalk and that's another thing that uh, the boardwalks enable us to do is to be um, unobtrusive and, and not really influence these animals' behavior. Often cassowaries will actually walk right underneath the boardwalk without even really paying much attention to you, which is quite cool. Um, and then we head up to the Atherton Tablelands where we get to have a look at this giant big curtain fig. So it's a strangler fig that kind of fell down. Um, so strangler fig hosts species died and fell over and it wedged itself on another tree and so all of the roots make this giant big beautiful curtain and this is one of our favorite places to go on night walks looking for possums and tree kangaroos and leaf-tailed geckos um, and such so uh, this is a highlight of of the region and somewhere where we try and go back to multiple times and then um just some of the, the wildlife that we get to view up there. So this the little guy on the, the left hand side is a paddy melon. So it's kind of a you've got kangaroos, wallabies, and paddy melons. Paddy melons are like the small wallabies and wallabies are I mean agile wallabies are bigger than a tree kangaroo. So it's not really size dependent. Um they're just classified differently for different behavior and 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 um and uh, social structures and all of that, but they're all five uh, five limbed creatures, um, and they're all marsupials. So we've got a little paddy mill in there, and then on the right hand side is the uh, the boy or the, the tree kangaroo that we found in the the Atherton Tableland. So they are is the Bennett's tree kangaroo down in the the Daintree Rainforest that I've never been able to see, but they do get seen from time to time. This is the tree kangaroo that we have a good chance of seeing up in the table lands. Um, this one actually bounced right through our group of guests while we were watching a platypus and jumped into the tree next to us. So um, quite a quite a unique sighting looking at uh, a monotreme and a, uh, a marsupial comes bouncing past you. Um, and a little brush here, a brush tail possum. I think this was actually taken just next to the uh, next to the um, uh, the curtain fig on a night walk. Um, so we're looking for the eye shine in these guys, and then they'll often just kind of sit there as we find them. We don't disturb them for very long, just to have a view and move on. Um, in the region, we also get to visit a bat hospital. So the Tolga Bat Hospital. Uh, they are uh, rescuers and saviors of both micro and mega bats. So the small little horseshoe face bats kind of thing that this is a tubular nose bat um, that are insect eaters all the way up to the big, big, big 
speckled or the red flying foxes, um, which are the fruit bats. So you spend a, a couple hours there in the afternoon. And then we also go on a boat cruise on Lake Berene, looking for some of these Eastern water dragons. And then the, uh, for me, the star of the show in that region is the duckle platypus there. I just don't think there's a weird creature on it. I mean, it's a mammal that swims and lays eggs and has a barb on its hind feet that's venomous. So it's a venomous egg laying mammal that swims and has a bill of a bird. Just, yeah, bizarre. Um, and these guys, this area of Yungabara is very well known for their, um, for their, their duckbill platypus sightings. So definitely one of the highlights um, in the tablelands. And then we head up north and west to Kakadu. So we hop on a plane uh, in Cairns and we fly across to Darwin. We overnight in Darwin. We go to the museum uh, the following day and uh, we have sort of a, a, a short city tour. Uh, and then the Botanical Gardens are some of the most beautiful gardens I've ever been to. Um, and the bird life there is just phenomenal. And then we hop on a small little plane and we head across to uh, to Bamaroo Plains, which is, if anyone's been on an African safari, it's a, it's based on an African safari. So tents, uh, it's a tented camp on the floodplains in uh, in far northern Northern Territory. Um, and uh, it's a, it's on a, a, a water buffalo reserve. So uh, there are water buffalo there which aren't native, um, but they they are uh, in most of the plains, and then also agile wallabies and paddy melons, and also phenomenal bird life. And then the swamps and the floodplains, we do often see uh, saltwater crocodiles, and so saltwater crocodiles don't always live in. The, well, they don't live in the ocean, but they live in that brackish zone between salt and fresh. So they are, they just won't, they typically won't live in, in fresh water, but it's that brackish zone and then they'll use the ocean to get, or the beach to get from estuary to estuary. So more truly an estuarine cro crocodile, but the, the name saltwater or salty is the most commonly known. So we're in Kakadu for three nights. Um, you can see us there setting up for a sundowner with the moonrise. So very safari-ish theme. Um, and there you've got some, an agile wallaby with a joey and pouch. So one of the cool things about uh, these marsupials is that they have the ability to have three aged offspring at once. So they can have a little pink joey. So virtually hatched uh, on one teeth in the pouch, and then they can have a joey in the pouch on another teeth. Now, the female can produce two different quantities or qualities of milk. So this joey needs a different one than this one, and she can do that off the same set of mammary glands. And then she has a joey at foot. So she has three babies all at the same time. Um, truly a, a, an evolved species, a weirdly evolved species for their, um, for their region. And that's true with kangaroos, paddy melons, and, uh, and wallabies. So pretty unique creatures uh, in being able to have all of those generations at the same time. A couple of little uh, Joe, Joey at foot practicing their, uh, they're pushing one another over. You can see the tails are still very thin. So they're not that muscular. It's also one of the possible differences between wallabies and kangaroos. That wallabies, apparently their spinal column doesn't go all the way to the base of the tail or to the tip of the tail, whereas a kangaroo does. Um, but again, it's just that that's the, there's no, there's not a lot of research has been gone into um, studying of that or at least none that I've seen. Um, and so uh, the easiest way is just the wallabies are usually like this in big numbers and groups. Kangaroos, you often see them by themselves. Um, but 
cute little guys pushing each other around um, in practice for what they will do one day as adults. Then, as I mentioned, the water buffalo. So the water buffalo in the region there in uh, Bamaroo Plains, in these big floodplains, kind of it does add to that African feel, um, but uh, but they aren't a native species. Um, they just bred there uh, on this reserve um, where we stay on, and uh, then also saltwater crocodiles. So uh, from time to time, we will see them in the um, in the swamps. Um, or on the floodplains, but then on our day that we go across to Kakadu National Park when we do the riverboat cruise um, in the end of the year, so September, October, November, the river is full up with them because it's the very end of the dry season before the flooding starts. And so all of the crocodiles that are usually out on the floodplains all converge down onto the East Alligator River. And so it was last October, I stopped counting on one cruise at 50 saltwater crocodiles. But then I went back in March or in April and they were all still out in the floodplains and we didn't see one. So a lot of these animals are seasonal, um, but there's always something cool to see. And if there aren't any saltwater crocodiles, the bird life is amazing in April because all of the summer migrants are there, all of the swamp birds are there in the river. Um, so still a phenomenal wildlife experience nonetheless. Then we also get to head out on these big giant airboats, which is a cool way of experiencing these floodplains. It gets you, rather than a propeller based um, uh, watercraft, where you can only go into certain depths, these they can actually go over areas where there's only about that, like a couple of inches of water, which allows you to get into those marshlands and swamps. Um, and so uh, it's a very cool experience. Um, and uh, and surprising me, a lot of the birds actually let you get pretty close uh, in this big craft. So these are some of the birds there. We've got that uh, the comb, combill jacana up top, and then um, a heron off to the right, and then their for or sorry left, and then their uh, the forest kingfisher down at the bottom. Um, and then the area is known as uh, Bamaroo Plains after the Magpie Goose because it's the that's what the, the the First Nations name for them is, and it's a breeding ground for them. So I think the when I was there in April, they were just just finding their nests in the floodplains and just starting to uh, the, the the goslings were almost ready to fledge. And when you get there in September or October, it's just flocks of hundreds to thousands of them. Um, and then the bird on the right hand side, the black, the black neck stalk, is the it's Jabiru. So that's what the area in Kakadu uh, is known as, or the capital of Kakadu is Jabiru. And uh, that's actually where we land when we go to Kakadu for um, for our our day visit. You can see there a flock of um, those magpie geese taking off uh, and literally just hundreds of them, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds into the thousands. So our scenic flight across to Kakadu, we go over, the, so there's the east, the south, sorry, the west, the south and the east alligator river. Obviously no alligators there. One of the first uh, explorers to map out this area had recently been on an, I mean, we're talking 150, 200 years ago, had re recently been on an exploration 150 years ago to North America where he had seen alligators and hop on a river here and see a saltwater crocodile and not know what a saltwater crocodile was and say, ah, oh, that's an alligator. So that's how the East and the West and the South Alligator have got their name was by a uh, misinterpretation of local wildlife and misidentification. So um, there are oh, no alligators there, it's all salties. And then this is our walk um, when we're at Kakadu, it's about a one mile circuit and some beautiful, phenomenal rock art there. Uh, and there's actually in one of the sections, there is a depiction of a thylacine, which is, um, so northern northern Australia was where uh, people would have first 
come through onto Australia. Um, and that's estimated between 60 and 100,000 years ago. And uh, it was also the last point of contact after the last ice age when all of the, the, the ice and the caps melted and the sea level rose. And that was about 10,000 years ago. Then when the dingo was introduced, um, so the dingo is now what is known as a, a naturalized invasive. So not an, a native species in the area, but it has become a part of the food chain by replacing something that was there before it. And that was the thylacine, which is more commonly known as the Tasmanian tiger. And there's actually a picture of one of these that's depicted there. And so uh, they were not really thought to have been in the Northern Territory, but because there's a, a, a rock art painting of one, that's a good indication that they were there. So just a couple of things that I'll go over quickly uh, before I get to a few points that I have and then get to some questions. Um, this is also something we go over in um, in the uh, the welcome presentation, and I'm not going to go over all of these, but this is just something to uh, to familiarise with for those that are coming. Um, in terms of electricity and charging, uh, you do need an adapter for most of the places that we go to. Some do have a USB port plug-in, but I would just suggest a, an international adapter. Uh, laundry, there is a laundry service um, when we are in the tablelands. They do offer complimentary laundry because we're there for two nights. And that's the only place that laundry will be done for you on the trip. Um, when we're at Lady Elliot, they do have a laundry. They've got a, a washing machine and a dryer there for us to use, but that's self-service. And then as well as the night that we are in Darwin at the Vibe Hotel, uh, they have a laundromat there, but that's also self-service. Um, and then sort of internet and phone calls as well as Wi-Fi. There is Wi-Fi uh, at, at all of the places that we go to, but because of the remoteness of it, it's not that good. Um, the only place where there isn't Wi-Fi uh, is when we go to Kakadu um, or Bamaru Plains. So you're off the grid for a couple of days there. We have access to satellite phones in the case of emergency, but it's a nice place at the end of the trip to just kind of unplug and unwind. Uh, and if there is someone that needs to get uh, to get hold of you, um, they can through us. So that's nothing to be worried about. Then uh, in terms of um, the so soft bags and the luggage, uh, a soft sided duffel bag is a duffel bag that is majority soft-sided. So a lot of duffel bags now are coming out with a, a sort of a, a hard um, frame at the bottom of them on one side to enable you to roll them easier. Those are fine, but a hard-sided suitcase or a, a bag that has more than, let's say, one or two sides that are hard would essentially not be defined as a soft-sided uh, duffel. So we do ask people to bring soft-sided duffels. If you have your laundry doesn't, or your luggage doesn't fit in the parameters that we have outlined, we do have duffel bags for you to repack in. But we also do recommend that for our trip out to Lady Elliot, as well as our trip out to Kakadu, and we do have laundry uh, luggage storage facilities in those times if you need to leave um, some stuff behind at the hotel or at the airport. Uh, because the north is often paired with the south, it's almost impossible to have a, to be able to pack for both of them without having a little bit more than what can fit in a soft side duffel. So we do have those duffel bags there, but if you prefer to bring your own, just bring that. And we have luggage storage facilities when we're in la on Lady Elliot down in Brisbane and then in Darwin when we go out to Kakadu. Um, and then in terms of uh, getting there and, um, and jet lag and things like that, um, I, uh, I, I'm flying from South Africa. And so for me, it's a nine hour time difference. But it's nine hours behind for you in the States. It, it's almost a day and a half ahead, 
even though the time zone is only eight hours difference, but it's ahead by a day and a half. Um, some people do do swear by uh, melatonin, and it's often advisable to take melatonin every day leading up to the trip for each hour time zone that you're going to change, and then one or two days after that to kind of get your body back onto uh, a normal circadian rhythm, and that does help with jet lag or flying in a day earlier and just kind of relaxing and um, and um, taking it easy. And then COVID protocols, um, we we don't require face masks to be worn um, unless any, unless someone is showing symptoms. Um, and we don't require testing to be done, neither does entry into Australia. So uh, that has um, uh, been relieved a little bit and lifted in terms of COVID protocols. Um, and then we do, but we do still go to areas that aren't as crowded and we do still try and respect the social distancing when we are in airports and things. Uh, we take a charter flight to get up to Lady Elliot and it's often just us on the plane. But then when we go from Brisbane to Cairns and from Cairns to Darwin, those are all on commercial, either Qantas or Jet, uh, Jetstar or Qantas Link flights. Um, and so we just try and separate ourselves from sitting in the monks with crowds when we are in those airports. Um, and then, yeah, thanks to everyone for tuning in. Um, I do have one other thing that I was asked to it in terms of swimming in water temperature. Um, so water temperature on Lady Elliot Island is about 75 degrees and that's mostly pretty consistent year round. It drops by a couple of degrees in the middle of winter, but it's usually in the, the low 70s. And then um, for the rest of the trip, uh, there is a, a beautiful swimming pool at Bamaroo Plains um, during free time to use there. Um, but we're moving so much and so quickly when we're in northern uh, northern Queensland and the tablelands that even if there was a swimming pool, it wouldn't really be much time to swim. So um, yeah, Sunny, I think we've got, what. Yeah, that's actually pretty good. We've got 10 minutes for questions. I think that's the most time I've ever let anyone have for questions. <laughs> Matt, you did great. Thank you so much. We do have a bunch of questions, so let's just jump right in. Um, can, you, can you clarify if snorkeling fins are provided? <clears throat> yes. So um, for anyone in terms of snorkeling gear, when we get to Lady Elliot, they provide us with either um, shorty, so a short uh, wetsuit, or if you would prefer a longer wetsuit, um, they do also provide those, and those are all included for us. Then they fit us with uh, with flippers and uh, and a snorkel and um, a mask, um, and then we keep those for the duration of our stay there. So those are our responsibility while we're there. Uh, I do recommend though to anyone that uh, is wearing has prescription glasses to bring their own snorkel uh, to bring their own mask if they have it um, because that's just a little bit difficult um, if you, you you do need glasses um, they won't obviously have your your required prescription but yes all of that equipment is given to us when we arrive. Great, thank you. And what is the activity rating of this trip? Um, it's, I, I, it, it wouldn't quite get up to moderate. The only reason I would say easy to moderate would probably be because of the pace of the trip. Um, certainly when we're in Queensland, it's the days are busy and the days are full. Uh, by the time we get to Bamaroo, it eases out and there's a lot more, there's a bit more free time and you can relax a little bit there. And then on Lady Elliot, it's kind of pick your own adventure in terms of energy level that you're willing to uh, participate and if you want to do all the activities you can but if you just want to kind of take it easy and go for a snorkel a day and do some bird watching that's also completely up to you so I would say easy to moderate and the only excuse me, the only reason I say the moderate side is because of the pace of of um, of Queensland. Okay great and do you recommend bug spray in the Daintree? Um, 
the guys do carry bug spray in the vehicles uh, for particularly for our night walks. That's usually when the most of the bugs are out. Um, and we do a night activity on, I think it's the first, the sort of the first and the third night. We definitely have a night activity where we go to we walk a little bit around the Daintree. And then we also go to um, uh, the curtain fig when we were up in Younger Borough. Um, but they, they do have bug spray. Um, they do have bug spray with them. But if you've got a brand of your own, then definitely bring it along. Okay. And will there be opportunities to change money in Brisbane? Or would it be better to exchange dollars at the airport? So you can, I've actually found it easier to just draw money out of an ATM uh, rather than finding a, uh, an, an exchange per se. So if you've got cash dollars at the airport is the easiest and they're gonna be the quickest. Um, but I, I don't even, I very rarely take cash, even though we do uh, a lot of the tips and all of that that's included as, as Nat have typically do for trips. Um, I just have my bank card and I draw from an ATM. Um, it just, I find it easier than trying to run around looking for an exchange bureau or something like that. But if someone does want to bring cash, then yes, at the airport would be the easiest place to do it. Okay. And will there be time to jog at Lady Elliot or other places along the route? Lady Elliot, probably yes. Uh, that would be the, the place where there was the best chance um, for the, the initial part of the trip. Um, our first morning when we leave for Lady Elliot, we, we're usually, uh, we have to convince the, the coffee shop down the road to open up for us early. They open at 6.30 or 6, because our flight is at, um, is at about 7.30, 7.45. It's a really early morning, that first morning. Um, but we're on the beach in Margate. If you come a day early, perfect, beautiful place to jog. It's flat, nice trails. Lady Elliot, uh, there's a park network and then there's the air, there's the airstrip. Running along the beach is difficult because it's that coral case. It's very dense, broken up coral. Um, but certainly if you're happy to run up and down the airstrip, yes. And then um, the morning we leave when we're in Darwin, that would be a good morning to run. Uh, and then in uh, Kakadu, not something I would recommend because our camp is right on the edge of the floodplain and the buffalo usually sleep in the, the thicket behind the camp at night and then move into the, the floodplain early in the morning. And it's one path that cuts the, the camp in two and the buffalo across that path. And so running up and down that path in the early morning probably wouldn't be a good idea. So okay. Brisbane, Lady Elliot, and then Darwin, yes. Okay. And would you recommend folks bring water shoes? Uh, so on Lady Elliot, they do have, um, they've got, they've probably got several dozen, if not maybe over a hundred pairs of, Crocs and water shoes that have been left behind by guests, et cetera, et cetera. So if you don't feel like lugging a pair of shoes over just to use them for those two days or those three days that were on Lady Elliot, you're more than welcome to borrow uh, whatever they have there at the resort. But I often take, um, I've got a pair of those uh, frog shoes that I take with me and those work as my water shoes. Um, but if you if you're particular about your own, then definitely bring them with. But if you don't feel like it, then they do have they do have them. Um, they're just not going to be. They might be a size too small or a size too big, or the padding on them might be a little bit less than what you used to. So um, it's completely up to the traveller. But they do provide water shoes. Yes. Okay. And um, are there any mandate? mandated vaccines or medical exams required for the visa to Australia? Not that I know of, and I just went through my application process uh, for renewal about a month ago, and they didn't require anything. They didn't require a health check or vaccine, proof of vaccine, anything like that. 
Okay, great. Uh, and that's, but that's now at time of stating. So that could change between now and the beginning of the season because I think the first trip starts in about a week. Uh, and then that runs all the way through into uh, November, December. So as of right now, not that I know of, no. Okay. Um, do you have any recommendations for a birding book? I have, I've got an app. I've got the eBird, um, the Merlin app. So there's Merlin ID and then an app that I enjoy that's a, it's, it's okay in terms of um, it's a, it's an illustrative app. So it's not a photograph. You can see that it's an illustration and that's called, um, it's called Oz birds and it's got a picture of a, a region's um, bower bird on the front of it. So it's a black and yellow bird. And it's on the app store um, but the easiest bird the easiest bird app is um the merlin the cornell lab merlin bird and you can just all you do is you just download um you can download uh, the packages or the, the the packets for each region so you download the app and then just and it's free you download the app before you get australia you download the australia bird package and it's got all the birds in australia so okay. that's the easiest one, much easier than bringing a book, especially Excellent. when weight limitations on private flights and all of that are so strict. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Are there any scuba diving opportunities on Lady Elliot Island? So if you are um, a scuba certified, so if you've got your PADI certification and uh, you wanna do a refresher course there, it's definitely something that you can arrange. Um, but it is going to be at your own expense and outside of any uh, any group activities that we might be doing. So when we go, if you want to go scuba diving, just let your expedition leader know, hey, I'm not, you're not really going to see me for the next two days. I'm here. I'm going diving. You're more than welcome to do that. Um, but it is going to be an extra expense on your own account. Um, but you do have to be certified. Uh, they do have a certification class and they do have a refresher class. Um, and that is definitely something that, that they can accommodate and help you with. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for that fabulous presentation. Um, I'll hand it back to you for closing comments. Thanks, Sunny. Um, and yeah, thanks to everyone for tuning in today. Um, and uh, I hope this was informative. Um, Thanks to, to Nat Hab, as always, for giving us this platform to share some information and ideas and reach out to all of you sitting at home and hopefully get to see some of you in the field. Um, so, yeah, thanks all of you. Thanks, Nat Hab. And thanks, Sunny, for hosting as always. I also want to thank those who tuned in today. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye.